Hey, it's the announcement guy. I'm out in left field. I'm often out here, but today I'm at Coors Field in left field. Wanted to let you know that on August 19th, our Mile High Choir is going to be singing right here. We're going to be singing the national anthem, and then we're going to be watching a Rockies game against the Giants. 6.40 is first pitch, and the choir will be singing before that. we got tickets up on the third deck above home plate in the shade. Great place to watch the game. So hope you'll join us out there. Go Rockies. Here's what's coming up. We're teaming up with the Action Center for our annual school supply drive. With your help, over 5,000 kids in the Jefferson County area will receive pencils, books, crayons, brand new school supplies that are needed for quality education. Drop off supplies today and the next two Sundays. You can also donate through our Amazon wish list. Visit our events page at milehighchurch.org for event details. On Friday, July 15th and Saturday, July 16th, the Inner Child Journey returns to Mile High Church. Each one of us, if we want to be our most authentic and powerful self, has to be willing to let go of the past. So I hope you'll join Dr. Raz and me for this wonderful transformative experience. Create deeply satisfying relationships of any type and heal trauma at our upcoming workshop, Whole Brain Relationships, Trauma-Informed Thinking with Nick Lawrence on Sunday, July 24th. Nick's work is based on science of mind practices of thought awareness, Thomas Troward and the autonomic nervous system, Deb Dana and polyvagal theory, and much more. We're offering tickets to young adults for half price and teens for free. Visit our events page at milehighchurch.org for details and to purchase tickets. Okay, I'm out here in left field. I kind of thought I was going to be playing today, kind of waiting for the manager to come out and give me the green light. But uh, yeah, choir will be singing out here August 19th. Hope you'll join us. Always fun. Best place to watch the sun go down and drink a cold one. Have a great week.
We are so blessed this morning to have Denise Rosier with us. She has become one of our premier New Thought songwriters. Uh, we got to work together when we were both living in California, and her and her wife, Christy, live in Colorado Springs, so we're so grateful to have you back with us, Denise. Spirit is in this place, not only in our sanctuary and the sanctuaries we create watching at home, but in each and every one of us. So I invite us to begin this morning by turn to someone around you, if you're here in the sanctuary, and say, I acknowledge the Spirit in you. If there's someone with you at home, you can do the same thing. Or if you're just watching alone today, I acknowledge the Spirit in you. See, yeah, Spirit is in this place. Uh, we're, We're so grateful to acknowledge that spirit, that spirit of hope, that spirit of resilience, that spirit of inspiration that keeps all of us going throughout our weeks. And it's also embodied in our vision and mission, which is coming up on the screens. If you want to say it along with me, it goes like this. Our vision, oneness revealed, a world of love, peace, and abundance for all. And our mission, to serve as a spiritual beacon for personal empowerment and global enlightenment. Uh, So grateful this morning to be having a special interfaith presentation from Reverend Zamira and our interfaith ministry, a prayer from Reverend Carol. You already heard from Denise and the band, and I'm so grateful to get to give a message here today. So with that, let us move into that weekly ritual of singing Surely the Presence, igniting and cultivating that sense of the blessed presence of God everywhere we are, especially right here and right now. How wonderful it is to be together in community, whether we are here in this sanctuary physically or watching from home online. What I know is that we are all connected. And what is so beautiful about this community is that we each express the divine in our own unique and diverse ways. And yet, we are all connected in that one heart, in that one mind. We are all of us drops in an ocean, all of the same essence. And so I celebrate that this morning. And I affirm an expectation of good, an expectation of health, an expectation of peace for each and every one of us, for our planet, for our world, and for all people everywhere. 
may we know peace, deep, deep peace and contentment and grace. And wherever people have gathered in prayer, in worship, in just a coming together to know the divine, whether that is a church or an ashram or a temple or a monastery or simply in the forest, in the peacefulness of the deep forest, I acknowledge that all of us celebrate that there is good and we acknowledge that good and we become an expression of that good. So this morning I am so grateful, grateful for this community that does so much good, not only in our own community but in the world. Grateful for Reverend Josh as he allows the divine to move through him and I absolutely know and affirm that we are inspired and uplifted by his profound message. Grateful for all the volunteers, all the teams that support Mile High Church. And so as I release these words and this truth into that beautiful alchemy of love and law, I absolutely know that all is well because all is God and so it is. morning. This morning we are honoring uh, the path of Sufism for our interfaith observance. There are many orders or groups who practice Sufism, and there is one well-known Sufi teacher, Hazrat Anayat Khan, who was very influential in bringing Sufism to the Western world. So we begin our honoring this morning with some words from Hazrat Anayat Khan. When one bell is rung, by the sound of that one bell, other bells will also vibrate. So it is with the dancing of the soul. And it produces its reaction, and that again will make other souls dance. Sufism is a mystical path of love that originated from the Islamic faith, and it isn't devoted to awakening each person's heart to have that direct experience of God. 
It's all about moving from that illusion of separation to that reality of divine oneness. And this all takes place in the heart. Sufism also embraces all faiths, and they embrace those faith traditions as paths toward the one God. So today, in honor of Hazrat Anayat Khan's birthday, which was July 5th, we're going to light the inner faith candles in the tradition of the universal worship service. It was an inclusive ceremony that he created with the intention of uniting all people and all faiths. So Robert Premack, who has joined us up here, he is both a mile high congregant and he's also a Sufi initiate. And he is going to light the candles as I read words from this inner faith service. To the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light symbolically representing the Hindu religion. To the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light, symbolically representing the Buddhist religion. To the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light, symbolically representing the indigenous faith traditions. To the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light, symbolically representing the Jewish religion. To the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light, symbolically representing the Christian religion. To the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light symbolically representing the religion of Islam. And to the glory of the omnipresent God, we kindle this light symbolically representing all of those who, whether known or unknown to the world, have held aloft the light of truth amidst the darkness of human ignorance. And now together I'd invite you, if you feel comfortable, to stand. We are going to move through the prayer of protection, and I'm going to introduce to you some movements. Um, Hazrat Anayat Khan wrote this prayer. And the movements I will show you first, and then we will all say the prayer together, doing the movements together. And so we begin by raising our arms as if we are receiving the blessings from above. And to this movement, we will say, I come from a perfect source, and I am bound to a perfect goal. And then you will bring your hands together in the prayer position. And in this position, in this mudra above your head, you will say, the light of the perfect being is kindled in my soul. And then we will gradually move our hands to our hearts. And as your hands are at your heart center, you will say, I live and move and have my being in God. And continuing on, the hands will come down as they separate at your waist level. They will come out to the side, and we will say, nothing in the world of the past or the present has the power to touch me. And then finally, we will rise up on our toes, and we will say, I rise above all. And you'll come back to standing. So let's do that together. The words will appear on the screen as we are doing the movements. I come from a perfect source, and I am bound to a perfect goal. The light of the perfect being is kindled in my soul. I live and move and have my being in God. Nothing in the world of the past or the present has the power to touch me. I rise above all. You may be seated. Mm -hmm. 
So we close this honoring with a blessing from the Sufi tradition. May the blessings of God rest upon you. May God's peace abide with you. May God's presence illuminate your heart now and forevermore. Amen and amen. You are doubt into action, vision renewed, perfect creation unfolding in view. Dust into garments, pieces into peace, tears into fountains, and chains into release. Bless you guys. Denise Rosier. 
Beautiful and brilliant. Thank you so much. Such a, a beautiful music. She's got CDs in the lobby, DeniseRosier.com, too. Thank you to our Mile High Band. Thank you to Reverend Zamira and our Interfaith Ministry for that beautiful presentation and ritual. Thank you, Reverend Carol. Uh, sh sh shout out to this weekend. Our inner child journey is returning after being gone for a couple of years. It's a powerful process. And uh, cheers to Dr. Raz and Dr. Michelle and the whole team putting that together. And just a, a reminder, some people have gotten so much out of this that there's a large scholarship fund. So if, if funds are keeping you back and you want that transformational experience, get in touch with someone so that we can get you there for that workshop. Uh, my message today is the way of the spirit. And I have a lighthearted subtitle of Jesus in July. <laughs> because in our Mile High Church, we often like to focus on Jesus during holiday time, where we honor Jesus as the embodiment of the divine spirit. But I want to focus a little bit more today on Jesus, the brilliant spiritual philosopher, perhaps the greatest spiritual teacher of all time, and also the most challenging to apply. And I often like to make the distinction between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings about Jesus. The teachings about Jesus include um, holidays and rites and how to do them from baptism to communion. Uh, it can include ideas around original sin or even hellfire and damnation. And we honor all of these, uh, except sometimes we, don't, we struggle with that hell and damnation part. <laughs> right? Sometimes I meet people who have a tough time describing what this teaching is to especially their, their Christian friends. And one of the ways that I like to put it is we're kind of like a very progressive Christianity because we believe in the teachings of Jesus. We just don't believe in hell. We don't believe in hell. And that has implications for how we view God, um, ourselves, and, and the world around us. Because we don't believe in hell, we don't believe in a judgmental God. We believe, believe that God is an unconditionally loving presence. Yes. Yeah. Because we don't believe in hell, we don't believe in a, in a test that says you have to be a particular religion to go to heaven and be loved by God, or of a particular nationality, or sexual orientation. Everyone gets in to that divine spirit. And we believe that we as human beings are not here to try and prove our worthiness to a presence that already knows, trust me, how beautiful and precious and awesome you are. But we are here to radiate the light of that presence and bring an experience of the kingdom of heaven on earth for ourselves and, and others. So quite a lot comes out of just not believing in hell. Get the hell out, hell. <laughs> right? And, and again, we honor all aspects of the, the Christian faith, the beautiful Christian faith that includes so many of the teachings of Jesus. And Christianity would generally present itself as a universal teaching for all. And I would just make the argument that I don't know if Jesus would agree with that. I don't know if the teachings of Jesus would tell us that Christianity, or what he would call the way, was for everyone. He says this in the Gospels, enter in through the narrow door, for wide is the door and broad is the road which leads to destruction. And many are those who travel on it. Oh, how narrow is the door and how difficult is the road which leads to life. And few are those who are found on it. That's some challenging stuff, right? That's some, that's some Jedi Knight type of training stuff to get, to get going. And scholars believe that Jesus called his teaching the way. The way. And I love that because it reminds me of one of my favorite religious teachings of the Tao from ancient China. And the Tao translates as the way as well, or the path. And where the Tao focuses on the way of nature and our organic world and how to live in alignment with it, Jesus is the way, focuses on his belief about the nature of God, the nature of the spirit and how it can manifest in, through, and around us. It's about a complete discipleship towards practicing an unconditional love and forgiveness, an unconditional confidence and faith, an unconditional humility and selflessness. And is it hard? It's damn hard. It's the hardest spiritual teaching that's ever been presented. What good is it, Jesus would say, to just love the people who you love, but love those who persecute you? 
Love those you don't like. If someone hits you on the cheek, present your other to him. If a soldier arrests you and makes you walk a mile with him, walk an extra mile with him. If someone steals your shirt, offer them your coat. And I don't know about you, but if someone hit me or someone I love, I don't know if I'd be able to turn the other cheek. I don't know if someone arrested me unfairly, if I'd want to even go that first mile with them. I don't know if someone stole my TV, if I'd want to offer them my Xbox, too. (laughs) It's challenging practice here. And what I'm trying to point out is I don't think that Jesus is making a new list of commandments for us to follow. He's trying to express how challenging the way of spirit is, and yet how powerful and how transformational to know that the way of spirit, that there's always a highest choice for us to take and manifest in our lives. The way of the spirit does not discriminate. The way of the spirit does not have a boss in the world. It doesn't have a schedule or a to-do list. The way of the spirit doesn't love some more than others. The way of the spirit is always calling us into the greater depths of who we are and who we are becoming. The first point I want to make about the way of the spirit today is that it's always the highest choice. The way of the Spirit is always the highest choice. And as I'll point out in a moment, sometimes we we don't always get to choose the highest choice based upon what we're trying to do. But part of the magic of the way of the Spirit is to know that it's, it's ever available to us. One of the things that made Jesus such a skilled and challenging teacher is he would challenge the common sense. He would speak to regular people about the everyday world and try to teach the way of the Spirit through that. One of the ways that he would do that was by challenging regular customs of the Jewish people. Jesus was Jewish that he was sharing with the purity laws. And Jesus would say that when it comes to the way of the spirit, there's only two laws. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And he wasn't disrespectful. He honored all the other laws, but not when they got in the way of the first two. And perhaps his most famous parable is the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan, where we have two individuals, a priest and a Levite, the two most revered within Jewish culture, pass by a dying man and don't help him. So here we already have the heroes of the story doing the wrong thing. Then a Samaritan, someone who was considered a lower caste in Judaism because they didn't practice all of the regular purity laws, someone who might be seen generally in the story to be a villain or not good enough. It's the Samaritan that helps the dying man. Why is that? Could it have been that the priest and the Levite were practicing the Sabbath that day? Could it be that they were practicing the purity law and worried about touching a dead person? We don't know for sure, but there's something to be said for always doing the right and best things, even when it challenges some of our basic norms, honoring the culture and customs, but always putting the love of God and the love of our neighbor first. Jesus would accord with the philosophy of do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. When we understand the role of the way of the Spirit in our lives, we're always a choice. I can choose the way of the Spirit or the the way of self-righteousness and know-it-allness. I can choose the way of the spirit or the way of resentment or judgment, the way of the spirit or the way of anxiety, the way of the spirit or the way of self-rejection. What's it going to be? And again, it's not always for everybody all the time, but to know it is there is the beautiful blessing. You know, I don't know if the way of the spirit would always work for Bill Belichick coaching the New England Patriots. I don't know if the way of the Spirit would always work for General MacArthur um, overseeing troops in World War II. I don't know if it will always work for you when your teen's not out of bed and school's already started. But it is always there, and it is always the truth, and the truth shall always set you free. Nick Hornby said that or it'll get you a punch in the nose, but spiritually, (laughs) the truth will always set you free. When my wife and I are at wit's end with one another, arguing about something that we know we'll forget about a week later, and we remember that love that binds us, 
Oh, the truth sets me free. When I get home late at night and my son hasn't taken out the trash or done his chores correctly, and I want to go up there and give him a piece of my mind, and I take a deep breath and take out the trash and make a commitment to talk about it with him later, I, I'm set free in that moment. When I'm in a place of self-denial, self-rejection, not feeling enough, and I remember that I'm a child of God, that that's the truth of who I am, I am set free. The way of the Spirit always sets free because it always welcomes the Spirit of God, the Spirit of love, the Spirit of peace, the Spirit of healing into any circumstance. Does it always make every situation into exactly what you want it to be? No, but it helps you transcend it in powerful ways. The second point that I want to make this morning about the way of the Spirit is that we must continue to cultivate our own inner consciousness. We have to keep our consciousness going and expressing so that it can be aware of the Spirit, because if not, we'll miss it. Ernest Holmes loved, our founder loved to write about Jesus, and he shared some words that were profound to me. He said, what was it that Jesus proclaimed? I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He was not talking about Jesus. He was talking about you. Jesus gave us back to ourselves. How are you ever going to consciously reach God other than through your own nature? There are no prophets other than the wise. There is no God beyond truth and no revelation higher than the realization of the divinity within us. That which the ages have failed to reveal, you and I must reveal, each to himself in the secret chamber of his own heart, the secret place of the Most High, where only and alone does one abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This aloneness is not a loneliness. It's the one all-inclusive, all-penetrating unity of everything that is. That's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff. And it's another part of this philosophy that I love so much is you can only get it through yourself. There's only one mind, it's yours. There's only one heart, it's yours. And you have to get it in your own way, which means we have to do our work in meditation. We have to do our work in prayer. Jesus tells us to go into our closets, to go within to experience and cultivate our own sense of the divine so we can bring it out into the world. One of Jesus' most interesting parables is the parable of the ten virgins, which I secretly like to call the first ever season of The Bachelor. (laughs) And it involves ten virgins, which means single women, who know a bridegroom or a a very eligible bachelor is going to be coming into town and they all want to greet him, but he's coming in the middle of the night. So they all get their lamps and Jesus says five of the virgins are smart and five are foolish because five have lots of oil to keep their lamps burning. The other five do not and they all go out and the word comes that the bridegroom is on his way and the women who don't have oil are, are all out of light and so they ask the ones with the light and the oil for some. And not only do they say no, but the the secret there is they can't give them the light. They can't give them the oil, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So the five go out, they meet the bridegroom, um, they go off. We don't know what happens, but there's certainly a rose ceremony, I'm sure, that takes place. They move on to the next week, and the other five don't get to go. And and again, to me, the the powerful point that I think Jesus is making in that parable, and Christians usually believe that it it, it tells of the second coming, but for me, it's all about the lamp and that oil that when we're doing our work in consciousness, we have that ability to have light in the darkness. We have that ability to be able to see and be ready for the blessing or the miracle to take place. You know, does a miracle happen if there's no one there to see it, to believe it, to experience it? Our own work brings us present to that miracle. And that's why the, the five maidens couldn't give it to the other ones, even if they wanted to. It's something that you have to earn and grow and cultivate yourself. There's an old simple Buddhist story about a master and his student, and they're at a seminar of sorts, and they come out of there, and the student says, oh my gosh, I've got so much out of that. He says, yes, this was great for good preaching material, but remember, unless you meditate constantly, your light of truth will go out. And for so many of us in these pandemic times with so much going on in the world, we've lost that sense of connection. And it's time to return there daily to the God of your own understanding. Because trust me, for your understanding, there's no other God that can ever exist. And we expand and we create a ground 
in that understanding for the divine to enter into us in new and profound ways that we can see hopefully demonstrate all around us as well. I'm, I like sometimes to bring little mantras into my meditation practice, and so I've got one for next week, and I'm going to invite you to use it in your week. You can take a picture of the screen or send me an email, Reeves at milehighchurch.org. I'll send it to you, uh, and it goes like this. Thank you, God, for your life in me, the ability to see, to hear, and to know. Thank you, God, for your love in me, the courage to receive, to give, and to grow. Thank you, God, for your spirit in me, the feeling to center, to deepen, and flow. You want to say it with me once here and at home? Thank you, God, for your life in me, the ability to see, to hear, and to know. Thank you, God, for your love in me, the courage to receive, to give, and to grow. Thank you, God, for your spirit in me, the feeling to center, to deepen, and flow. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your life in me your love in me, your spirit in me. And it's when we build that awareness of that life of spirit in us, not all that it is, but it's all that we are right here and right now, we begin to add an additional layer to our lives that perhaps we didn't know was there before. It's the layer that says, yes, you're living your human existence. You're in the you-know-what of it every day, doing your thing, working hard, not afraid of conflict, doing, doing it. And yet there's this extra layer that says life is about bliss. Life is about love. Life is about the spirit. And how can we more better embody it for ourselves and be a presence for others to experience it too? And this brings me to my final point about the way of the spirit today. And that is that you've got to use it or you're going to lose it. You've got to use it or you're going to lose it. Jesus tells us to pray in our closet, and yet he invites us to be the light of the world when we express in everyday life. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We've got to let our light shine. We've got to embrace that truth of who we are and and, and bring it with us wherever we go. And it sounds like a simple thing, just be the light. And yet I can tell you personally, there are times where I'm afraid to be the light. There's times where I'm too self-rejecting to be the light. There's times where I'm too not present and caught up in some conflict or judgment to to be the light. There's times where I'm too worried someone's going to be mad at me or I'm going to offend someone by being the light. There are things, little things that we do each day that can prevent us from being that light. But to remember that we've been given these incredible gifts, the gift of spirit, the gift of knowing the life of God in us gives us everything we need to express and to share that light in that life. The final parable that Jesus tells to his disciples is the parable of the talents. And it's about a Lord who gathers three people from his kingdom together, and he gives each of them talents or money based upon their abilities. There's a clue right there that it's about consciousness. It's about spiritual awareness, spiritual qualities. And he says, I'm leaving and I'll be back. Do something with the talents. And when he comes back many months later, the first person has doubled everything that he's been given. The second person hasn't quite doubled it, but has come pretty darn close. The third person has hoarded and saved all of the talents that he's been given and hasn't spent a single one. And the Lord taketh away his talents and gives them away. The message again, use it or lose it. I love how Butterworth put it. He said, life is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift to God. How blessed have so many of us been with our qualities of virtue, with our empathy and compassion, with our wisdom and intelligence. I'm not trying to blow smoke here. It's the truth of who each one of you are, the preciousness of life and the the awareness to, to know that it's in you and inside of you. So we want to share it. 
We want to give it. And that's the great thing about giving from spirit. It never decreases. It only increases wherever you go when you give from that heart. So yes, go to Starbucks to get a latte, but also go there to be the light of the world. Go to work to pay the bills and make the money, but also to be a presence for compassion and forgiveness. Look in the mirror to make sure you are ready to go, but also to remember that you are a precious child of God and to hear that voice of the divine say to you, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That's that extra layer that the way of the Spirit brings us. It helps us to truly see and to bring the best of ourselves into every moment. It's hard to stay there. That's why the way of Spirit is so difficult. But you can do it, and I can do it, and we can do it together in incredible ways. This is what I believe Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. By being centered in our heart, it allows us to see all of those opportunities to call the divine forth in our lives. Or as a great Sufi teacher, Ahmed Aktif, once said, he said, Let the eye of your heart be opened, that you may see the spirit and behold invisible things. One more time. Let the eye of your heart be opened, that you may see the spirit and behold invisible things that understanding that there's that invisible essence to our lives, that way of the Spirit. And when we combine that with our daily activities, our daily choices, our life begins to resonate. There begins to be a congruence where we feel reconnected with the best of ourselves and the best of the divine. And that's when the healing starts happening. That's when the abundance starts happening. That's when the connections start happening. That's when the miracles start becoming normal in our life, when we flow and bring that inner and outer aspect of ourselves together to be who we are and the awesome children of God that we are as well, all rooted in the same life. I want to close today with a quote from Leo Tolstoy, perhaps the greatest novelist of all time, Russian novelist. And in his later life, he did his own um, interpretation of the Gospels, Uh, called the gospel in brief. And so this is his interpretation of what will be a familiar saying to many of you who are familiar with the gospel of John. He says, speaking for Jesus, my teaching is the tree of life. The father is he who cultivates the tree. He cleans and grooms those branches that bear fruit so that even more fruit will grow on them. Hold to my teaching of life and life will grow within you. And just as the branch does not live of itself, but takes life from the tree, likewise, you will take life from my teaching. My teaching is the tree. You are the branches. Whoever lives by my teaching of life will bear much fruit. And so, apart from my teaching, there is no life. So just taking those words into prayer, and I invite any of our incredible prayer practitioners who'd like to stand and join me for this prayer to do so. What a beautiful image, that tree of life as an expression of spirit and the way of spirit itself, rooted in infinite love, endless compassion, eternal, unconditioned joy, the glory of knowing the truth of who we are in the light and love of God. I choose to see myself as rooted in that tree this day, and I invite each person who joins me in this prayer to do the same, to know that indeed we are the branches of this infinite love, this divine life, this unconditioned joy, that it outstretches and grows when we allow ourselves to be pruned of anything that no longer belongs in our consciousness, in our body, in our affairs. We let it all go. We even say, yes, God, you do it. And we allow all of the seedlings that are at that endless root of the divine truth fill our being so that we may flower and blossom in accordance with who we are, letting go of all the past stories of who we are not, to be boldly one with our spiritual nature today. Knowing that nature, we can apply it wherever we go as we branch out and bring shade to those we love who are struggling, as we branch out into areas of new possibility that may be brought discomfort before, but we know where we're rooted in now. 
we open up being all a part of that tree of life, all a part of the way of spirit, integrating it into each area of our lives. Like that mustard seed, it grows and expands into the largest of things, what started as the tiniest amount of faith. We embrace it now, and we accept the healing, the richness of being, the forgiveness, the kindness, and just the pragmatic way of living aware that we are a part of something infinite in its depth and its expression of beauty. Thank you, life. And so it is. Denise Rosier, thank you to this incredible band. Thank you, Bijou, Mike, Kent, Rob. We're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for this incredible music ministry at Mile High Church as we move into our time of offering. I also want to just give thanks and a shout out to all of our um, Make a Difference team members who are putting together the school supply drive for us. Uh, I'm so grateful for the, the great impact that we can have all together as spiritual community to help kids have supplies for school with the Action Center this year. And just know too, you can bring stuff next week. You can go on your phone right now and give through the Amazon wish list. You can give them money out there. But are, are any of them in the room? right now? Are they all outside? We're so grateful for all of you. Thank you to Reverend Millie and all of your leadership. Hey, Francesca. And thank you for all of your financial support of Mile High Church. We're so grateful for uh, the money that comes in the basket, that comes online, that comes via check, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just know that your gift, no matter what it is, um, comes with an energy that helps sustain us and uplift us as we move into these future days, co-creating awesome spiritual community. Sometimes we don't know what it's going to look like, but we know it's going to look awesome. We'll keep up on that. So with that, please take your gift and bless it however you choose, but we will also say our offering affirmation together. Divine love, as me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, and all that I circulate. And so it is.
meet her out in the lobby to get some of her amazing music to take home with you. You can also visit her website online at deniserosier.com. What a wonderful thing to listen to in your car, in your every, all, really all day long, really. <laughs> Um, so if you are here for the first time today, we welcome you. We welcome you right into the heart of our community. And I would love to greet you and to meet you. I'll be out in the Welcome Center, so please joining me out in the lobby after the service. And our beloved prayer practitioners are headed down front here. And so if you're feeling called this morning for um, a couple minutes of prayer, just to dive deep, then please come up and pray with them. You can also have a prayer request and, and uh, submit it out in the lobby or online. And uh, yeah, give, welcome. Give yourself that gift. I want to get a prayer from each and every one of these <laughs> incredible practitioners this morning. It's a great experience. Reverend Zamira, your day of interfaith isn't over. You've got something else coming up today. Yes, yes. I hope that you'll all consider joining me. We have another field trip today. Today's a Judaism field trip, and I'll have some information on this also out in the Welcome Center. But we're going to be visiting the Kabbalah experience. Um, for some mystical Judaism, and we're also going to visit a synagogue at the Hebrew Educational Alliance. So that's today, 12.30, down in Denver. Awesome. Thank you, Zamir, for all the great work you're doing. Uh, Dr. Roger Teal will be facilitating our Healing Light service tonight at 5 p.m. It's a wonderful contemplative service. Happens in our boat uh, auditorium at 5 p.m. So come back. It's in person only. Uh, and this Wednesday, if you're not sick of hearing me talk, I get to speak about the topic of can you, for yes, you can forgive uh, Wednesday night right here in the Teal Sanctuary at 7 p.m. Uh, so with that, if you'd like to stand, we're going to say our benediction together and sing our peace song, knowing that the way of the Spirit is is wherever we are, may it show us with inspiration, with guidance, with divine love and radiant light. And so it is. Amen. Amen.